which group every people group every tribe every nation just uh, by way of reminder if you give the life point in any form or fashion you're a part of TTI you're a part of giving to that ministry that uh, touches the lives of so many around the world and we have an opportunity to, to take part in it whether you knew it or not I think it's not an accident that we're focusing on the Timothy initiative a global church planning initiative and a passage like we have today you know we're in the third part of a massive unfolding story, the biggest continuous story in the book of Acts. We had a vision for Cornelius, we had a vision for a guy named Peter, and now we have their conversation together. It's like this massive unfolding story. If you're like, who are these people? I'll give you a brief overview. We'll also kind of just jump right into the story that we're in today. Again, not, not an accident that this morning when Monica was preparing for worship, they said how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity that this morning we're going to talk about how God is orchestrating unity in a divided world. If it was true for Cornelius and Peter, if it was true for the house of a Roman centurion and a Jewish fighter who couldn't always control his mouth, it can be true for us too. Uh, as you find your way to Acts chapter 10, verses 17 through 33, I have a little bit of an admission to make, a little bit of a confession. Uh, that is this, I was not uh, always this refined and well-cultured, okay? I know what you're thinking. For those of you who know me, you know that's a joke. For those of you who do not know me, that was a joke. Okay, I know, you know, my parents put in a lot of time, extensive amount of effort. My grandparents put a lot of time to try and culture me. What did that look like? That looked like chess club and losing a lot, okay? That looked like piano lessons uh, that went semi-okay. That looked like going to ballets, uh, which made me very, made me feel things, okay? Uh, mostly <laughs> anger. Um, and it also, and it also included like going to musical performances. And I do appreciate about that uh, with them, but I have, I have one major grievance, right? We would take this vacation to Lake Erie in Ohio. Everyone go, ooh, Lake Erie in Ohio every year. And we would rent a cottage alongside like cousins and family, extended family. And each night, part of your like admission ticket was uh, a show. And the shows ranged from like, semi-tolerable to like tolerable, okay? That's kind of the range. And then every once in a while, there'd be good ones, okay? Every couple decades. We've been there for 30 years, right? So it's a long time. Uh, and one of the traditions that we always had is each year we would come back and we would uh, go to this vacation place. And one of the people that would come and perform was uh, the symphony. And we had a rule. The rule went like this. The goal of vacation was not to go to these shows. And so my parents and cousins, all the family agreed upon a rule. The rule went like this. After the third round of applause, you could choose whether you want to leave or stay. And so for most shows, the person who was kind of the director of the cottage place would, would come up and everyone would clap and we'd say, all right, that's one clap, everybody, that's one clap. And all the cousins would look at each other and say, we only got two more, endure two more claps and then we can go play putt-putt, eat ice cream, uh, I don't know, play games all night, only got to get two more claps. And the whole time, right, we're just downing candy. We've gotten like a dollar or two, and I've got like six lits in my pocket just walking in to hear the symphony like this. Like no innocent person ever walks in like this, right? So I'm, I'm like packing some serious candy, right? And the whole time I'm just trying to tolerate it. This usually works out fine, right? Except for when the symphony comes into town because the first clap happens nice and quick. You're like, all right, only two more claps. Two more claps, that's it, and we'll be out of here. The problem is if you've ever heard anything that comes from a symphony, the first song is... I don't know, I'm not, I'm not like, but a year. It's a year long pretty much, right? So you're sitting there and you've heard one clap and then two claps when the conductor comes up and the third clap is like a lifetime away. I'd grown a beard during the time. I was no longer fitting into my clothes. That's an exaggeration, of course, but not too much, okay? It was a long, long time of enduring this uh, symphony. Lo and behold, I didn't appreciate it, right? But I've come to appreciate something as I've been studying this week and thinking about how God is orchestrating Cornelius and orchestrating uh, Peter, and he's doing all these different things in the early church, the unfolding of his church. I, I've, I've no, grown to kind of appreciate that role of a conductor. Because what a conductor does, if you're not familiar with it, is they set the pace for the song, like how fast it's supposed to function. Sometimes they force the symphony to like go back and repeat a section. They cause a volume to raise up. They cause... Uh, uh, instrument over here to be concerned with its own instrument and an instrument over here to be concerned with its own sound and they bring it together into one cohesive note. No it, one instrument tries to become the conductor. No one instrument, the piccolo doesn't try and become the tuba. I don't even know, that may not be in the symphony, okay? If it is, sorry. But no one instrument tries to become the other one. No one instrument tries to usurp the position of the orchestra conductor. And the conductor's job is to bring together many different voices and bring them together in unity. And even though they're different, drastically different, we might say, 
The job of the orchestra director is to bring them all together. Friends, that is the story that we are reading here. That's the story that you actually belong to whether you knew it or not. The God who is more masterfully than any orchestra conductor ever is bringing together many different people for his glory. Think about Acts chapter 1 through 7, the gospel going forth from Jerusalem, all sorts of Jews experiencing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost and going all over the ancient world. In Acts chapter 8, you see the gospel advancing into Samaria because of persecution. Do you remember it? Acts chapter 10, we're finally moving into a space where God's spirit is falling not only on Jews, but on Gentiles in a real way. If you remember at the beginning of Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, Cornelius receives a vision from the Lord. Do you remember it? And he receives a vision from the Lord. It says, your prayers and your alms have gone up before the Lord. We're told that he's a centurion, a leader of men, balanced. And that he's also a God-fearer. So he's not a Jew, but he respects the Lord. And he's been praying to the Lord. If you're real, reveal yourself to me. Let me know you, right? And so he prays these things. The, they say, we have received, the, your, the Lord has received your prayer. He has seen your, your charitable deeds. He knows who you are. He knows your name. Now take three messengers and go. Send them to Joppa where we find our second person who receives a vision. So the first one's name is Cornelius. The second man's name is Peter. Peter's uh, the famous one you probably know, like Simon Peter, did a whole bunch of things in his life, follower of Jesus, right? And he exists in the house of Joppa. Inside uh, Simon Peter is in Simon the Tanner's house in Joppa. Really unfortunate. I don't know why they couldn't have had different names, but that's just what we got, okay? It's gonna get crazier in Acts chapter 12 where we got two Herods, two Marys, two James, two Johns, two everybody, okay? So this is just the start of where things get odd, okay? Simon the Tanner, Simon the Peter, okay? That matters for later. But Peter is on the rooftop, and we're told in verses 9 through 16 that Peter's on the rooftop, and he gets this vision of a meat-filled sheet coming down from heaven. Carnivores say, yeah. (laughs) And he's told to kill and eat what comes in the sheet. The one major problem, that almost rhymed. That'd be the weirdest Dr. Seuss book ever, right? The sheet lowers down, sheet meat, eat. Okay, we got it. That's, that's all I'll do. The sheet comes down. There's a bunch of food, but he's not allowed to eat it. The Jewish law that he had lived his entire life by, he's not allowed to eat it. And so it lowers down. The voice comes from heaven. Take and eat. Do not call anything common or con- unclean what the Lord has made clean. And he's like, what is this supposed to mean? And the, once again, the golden corral elevator sort of deal comes down. And it's like, I, I don't want to eat it. And it happens again. And three times it happens and the story ends. And when our story picks up, Cornelius' men, remember that verses 1 through 8, Cornelius' men are on the way. They're like entering the city. They're on their way to visit Peter. And Peter has just now gotten the vision. Three men coming towards him, but he had three times a sheet lowered from heaven filled with clean and unclean. It was a mixture of all sorts of foods, right? So he doesn't have a whole lot of time to figure it out. And that's where our story picks up. Two men who've received visions, messengers coming into the city. Peter is receiving a vision from the Lord, and he doesn't know what's going on. Read with me in verses 17. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be behind me. Verses 17 through 33, as we go, we'll pull application uh, in our secondary study of Scripture, but we'll read through the whole story together just so you have a view, vantage point of it. 17 says this, Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed, which makes sense, because of the dream was pretty, pretty odd. As to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, it's written like he was continuing to ponder and wonder and scheme and try and think what was happening, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down. And accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one who you are looking for. What's the reason for your coming? Note how often uh, Peter asks questions and they ask questions of him. This is a conversation that changed the world, not just a speech, not just another sermon, but a conversation in a house that made a difference. Verse 22, and they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. Pretty impressive resume. Was directed by a holy angel to send for you and to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. And so he invited them in to be his guests. Peter invited them into the house of Simon the Tanner to be his guest. Second half of verse 23, the next day he rose, being Peter, and he went away with them and some of the brothers from Joppa who accompanied him, verse 24. And on the following day, so that's day one, the messengers come. Day two, they travel. They stay somewhere between Caesarea and Joppa over the night, and then they eventually get to Caesarea to Cornelius. But that's what we're about to read. Verse 25, and when Peter, oh, sorry, verse 24, and the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he had called together his relatives and his close friends. Verse 25, and when Peter entered, 
Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I too am a man. And he talked, as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered there. Listen to verse 28. This is one of our key passages for today. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone from another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And so when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. Verse 30 through 33, Cornelius explains, and this is our last section of today's text. Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was in my house praying in the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. We're told it's an angel earlier. And said, verse 31 is where we're reading, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner. And so I sent for you at once. You have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Verse 17. Remember, just brief background. Cornelius receives a vision. Your alms have ascended, send messengers. They're at the gate. They're at Peter's house while he receives the vision of the meat sheet falling down. And he's like, yes, yum, this is awesome. Uh, Except for he says, no, I will not have it, Lord. It's interesting he calls him Lord and says no at the same time. That's kind of a problem. We do that a lot of times, though. We call Jesus Lord and we say, no, not yours, but mine. Okay, that's what was happening here. But uh, in his defense, it's a weird dream, right? And so the dream comes down, knock, knock, knock at the door. But before we ever get a knock at the door, we are introduced to Peter, who is perplexed, right? He is inwardly perplexed. He is absolutely confused. You would be too, right? You've had a weird dream. Have you had a weird dream before? I dreamed one time I was jet skiing on top of a chocolate cake the size of a football field. (laughs) And I have never been the same since, right? Jet skis aren't the same. Chocolate cakes aren't the same. You're wondering, how was it on a football field? I don't know. Magic, okay? Incredible dream. Not, dream, not just a dream that changes his mind, but a dream that like challenges his reality because the dream was not unclear. He knew what the parts were. There was unclean food in the blanket that was being lowered from heaven. It was an audible voice of God speaking to him. He was clear on the parts, but he was not clear on what it actually meant. We could even say like he knew what it meant, but didn't want to accept what it meant. But you know what's so beautiful about this passage for you and me, hope giving for you and me, hopefully? is that he did not wait to obey because he didn't understand. He didn't allow his lack of understanding to keep him from obeying God. A lot of times we um, wait to obey until we understand, acting as though we have to have full comprehension before we'll obey. But in his perplexity, in his confusion, what happens? Knock, knock, knock. At the door, an opportunity presents himself for him to act in obedience. I pray that for each and every person who would claim to follow Christ, that you would outkick your coverage with obedience. I'll say it like this. I I pray that your obedience to Christ outpaces your willingness or your ability to comprehend all of the things of Christ. Because his obedience actually leads him to a place of understanding. He doesn't wait to obey until he understands. Part of his understanding is walking out in obedience. So knock, knock, knock comes the door. Inwardly perplexed. On the rooftop, verse 17 and 18, Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. Knock to the gate. You don't want to get the wrong Simon, right? They knock on the gate, Simon Peter, in the house of Simon the Tanner. Really unfortunate. Don't know why it could have been different. But I imagine them being like, knock, 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 uh, Simon, the, like the Peter one, not the blood and guts one, not the Tanner one, but just the, the Peter one. We want him, right? But, but, uh, but what happens? Is Peter aware immediately that they're there? It seems like no. Peter's on the rooftop. Messengers from Cornelius have come. Peter's perplexed. You would be too. And the passage tells us that he continued wondering. He continued pondering. This is not the first, definitely not the last time somebody pondered food so deeply that they daydreamed like nothing else was existing around them. Like all of us who've been like, ah, wings. And you've thought about those things and you've missed everything. That's what Peter was going through. How does this make sense? Knock, knock, knock at the door, and he is completely unaware that they are there. It's actually the Holy Spirit who has to come into his scenario to make him aware. At every turn, Peter is like weak and needs help, right? Needs help to figure it out. But that's also kind of the story of the unfolding of the church in the entire book of Acts. Is that every turn, the Lord is making a way for them to become aware of what he wants them to accomplish. 
Peter is like uh, one instrument who doesn't know what quite how his noise that he's making fits in with the other noise that's taking place 37 miles away from Caesarea to Joppa. And yet God is orchestrating something massive. So Peter on the rooftop, the Holy Spirit intervenes. Remember, we've seen an angel with Cornelius, an angel of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Peter, the voice of God, the voice of the Lord. God is involved at every turn for the seeker, for the one sending, for the person inside the house, for the person outside the house, for the Roman centurion Italian cohort leader named Cornelius, and for the Jewish fighter who can't control his mouth named Peter. So what about your story? What about your specific aspect makes you think that God couldn't communicate to you? And that God doesn't desperately want to orchestrate you into something bigger than yourself. But Peter's on the rooftop. Knock, knock, knock comes the door. Three times the vision had come down, and the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, three men are at your door. Do you think that's an accident? I think no. So later on in the story, even though he moves from being a place of perplexed to understanding, I think this is the start of Peter starting to understand. Three times the sheet comes down, three men at the door. And the Holy Spirit speaks to him, look in verse, I think it's 19, and while, the, uh, while Peter was pondering the vision, the idea is that he was ongoing, pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Like, Peter, hello, stop thinking about the meat now, it's time to go. It's time to encounter these three guys who are at the door, and he says, behold, three men are looking for you, verse 20, rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. It's not just that they come bearing news, it's that they have been sent by God that makes a difference. And even when they repeat the character of Cornelius, it's not just his character that makes Peter go with him. It is the fact that Cornelius has been visited and and, and, and kind of encountered God in a very real way. That outside of God's covenant people in the Old Testament, Israel, that God is doing something massive. Notice what it says, um, go with them, but only after you've checked all the boxes. No, go with them, but once they've like turned culturally Jewish, then you can travel with them go with them, but like after they do these certain, no, it says go with them without hesitation. It's an awesome word. The full range of that word is without hesitation, without reservation, without doubt, without uncertainty, and last one, ready, pay attention to this one, without discrimination. Go with these men without discrimination. It was not illegal for him to go with them. It was not against Jewish custom for a Jew very carefully to host a Gentile in their home but he is right on the line. Are you with me? He is right on the line of what is allowed and what is not allowed according to the Mosaic law. And so for 2,000 years, his family members and everyone who's come before him, his rabbi, his parents have all told him to live a certain way. And yet he has seen Jesus move. He has seen Jesus orchestrating massive things. He has seen the Holy Spirit orchestrate massive things. And now he is walking it out. Verse 22, verse 23. And so he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. said this earlier, but if you were to imagine a map right along the sea, on the bottom you'd have Joppa, and about 35 to 37 miles away you'd have Caesarea. So the story goes like this. Peter has the vision. They come in. He hosts them for a night. They travel for a day. They spend a night, and then the next day they get to Cornelius. That's four days. A lot of us have wrestled with questions and, like, doubts and uncertainties for longer than four days, but imagine four days as Cornelius. He had sent messengers out, and he was waiting. But in Cornelius' waiting, he added more people to the circle. He added his family and his friends. And so when we finally meet Cornelius, the room is packed. And you know what? Peter does the same thing. When Peter's on his way, he also adds more people to the room. Acts chapter 11 tells us that he didn't just grab a few men from Joppa, he grabbed six. So six men from Joppa who were going to Caesarea, that's where Cornelius was, and he brought along a group so that they could verify what the Holy Spirit accomplished in the house of Cornelius. In the affectionate words of Josh Sharp, Quentin Tarantino, this puppy, the Holy Spirit falls on a bunch of Gentiles. That's copyright Josh Sharp, I didn't say it. That's true, that's how the story ends. The Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all his household. It's a household salvation, it's massive. Right, but Cornelius gathers a group Peter grabs a group, so three messengers, Peter, six people, ten people traveling together. One day, multiple days, and they finally arrive. I wonder what their conversation was like. So, uh, what's it like being a Gentile? I don't know. <laughs> what, was the, what was their conversation like as they were on the way? But you know what? This is, a really, this is a really significant thing for you and me. When we believe that God is orchestrating unity in a divided world, we will necessarily involve other people on the journey. What did Cornelius do as he waited? He got more people in the house. Like, I want more people in the house to experience it with me. 
When you think that what God does in your life is not designed to stay private, but to be public, you will invite more people into the room. Like Peter, you'll invite more people onto the journey. So if your faith is solo, let me ask you the question, like, are you believing that God is not only interested in transforming you, but the circles that exist around you, your neighbors that exist around you? So everybody's getting, the room is packed. Like the room is packed where they're going, which is also pretty crazy. Think about it. Cornelius had prayed and waited, and he was so assured that something was going to take place that he packed the room. Would you, pack, would you pack the room hoping that, or knowing that Jesus was going to fulfill what he was good on his promise? But in the position between a prayer and it being answered, he chose to pack the room out. So when Peter shows up with the group, they enter into a packed house. And this should make us nervous, right? Because sometimes Peter says stuff, you're like, ooh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have said it like that. Or maybe we would have, but we like revise history and say we wouldn't have, you know, those sorts of deals that we never do, of course. But he arrives at the house, and the room is packed, and the first person to greet Peter is Cornelius. Read with me. And the following day they entered uh, Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down on his feet and worshipped him. Uh Uh-oh, verse 26. And Peter lifted him up, saying, stand up, I'm a man too. So Cornelius... Remember, so we want to say, like, why are you worshiping Peter? Like, that's an that's a odd thing. You're a commander of uh, hundreds of men. You're, you're like a strong figure. Why are you doing that? First off, he, rece- he received a, a vision from heaven and an audible word from the Lord. You don't know if Peter's an angel. You don't know if he's a human. So before we go, Cornelius, what are you doing? We probably say, how much better would I have been, right? This is a customary form of respect, but Peter says, I am not the dispenser of salvation. I am merely a communicator of it. You hear it? I'm a man too. So he turns to him and says, I'm a man too, stand up, we can talk. (laughs) And so it says, as they were talking, Cornelius' first interaction with him is to like somehow assert that he's more than just a human, which is like not a great, maybe it is a great first impression, but not in the right way. And it says that Peter and Cornelius walked and the room or the courtyard that would have existed, the open courtyard was packed full of people. When Peter entered, Cornelius met down, uh, his feet worshiped him, verse 26, he lifted him up, stand too, I am a man. Verse 27, And he talked with them, and he went in and found many persons gathered there. And he said to them, this is Peter speaking to them, and we all should go, okay, Peter, here's your shot, buddy. You've said many a controversial thing. Peter, Jesus has rebuked you on many occasions. Good luck. Peter's first sentence could be translated like this. You know, guys, it's illegal for me to be here. So, (laughs) like, that's basically his opening line. Do you see it? He's like, you know, it's really unlawful what we're doing. And you're like, okay, weird opener, but I guess I'm listening. You know, that's kind of how Peter starts his speech. And as he talked with them, he found many persons gathered there, 28. He says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit with anyone of another nation. The word used is like, it's illegal for us to be joined together or associated with people outside of God's people in the Old Testament, Israel, but God big, big time sentence. I read that and I go, Peter, where'd you get the knowledge from? Like, you start the story very confused and there's no point where you don't look confused until this moment where you're surrounded by people who are not like you. Ready? Peter did not just send a message, he allowed his life to become the message. Because when you exist in a place that is actually illegal for you to be, you are proclaiming something really profound. Are you with me? When we stop being people who just communicate a message but choose to reflect that message in our lives, the world will change and we'll be part of the orchestrating, unifying work of God in this world. He is, it's illegal for me to be here, but I'm here because God. This isn't um, Peter like creating new things. He had seen it in the life of Jesus. Powerful story in Mark 7. Jesus is surrounded by Pharisees and they're like, what's the deal? Your disciples don't even hand sanitize before they eat. And Jesus says, didn't Isaiah prophesy about you, you hypocrites? And everyone's like, oh, man, Jesus just said that to them. And Jesus says, you're more concerned with unwashed hands than you are unclean hearts. And the point of that story is in Mark 7, I think it's verse 19. It'll be on the screen behind me. You'll correct it. But in that story, Jesus declared that all foods had become clean. So when Peter looks back on the life of Christ, he is saying that something world-changing has taken place in the person of Jesus. The ceremonial laws set apart the people of, people of God. They kept them healthy. They kept them separate. They kept them distinct so that they could be people uh, from the world for the world, as Pastor Josh said. And so Peter is standing there. It's illegal for him to be there, and he proclaims, but God. Because in Christ, the cleansing level of sacrifice had been fully fulfilled and accomplished in Jesus. 
And when he said it is finished, he meant it is finished. And the role of the ceremonial law, the things you eat and do not eat, didn't apply anymore. And you know what that meant? It meant that for every person who ate those foods with whom you could no longer fellowship, you can now be together with, but God. In that single phrase, in that single sentence, it challenges us to think of any uh, ethnicity, any skin color, any personality type, any gender, any specific position that is unworthy or we should consider undeserving to hear the gospel and respond in faith. There are none. Because he is saying, but God has shown me that I should call no person common or unclean. That no person is should be kept back from the place of being able to hear and respond rightly to the word of God because in Christ, the red regulations of the law have been fully fulfilled. That they are no more. They've served their purpose. The world's flipping upside down and Peter is hanging on for dear life. <laughs> and he shows us what it looks like. Everything has been changed. Everything is different. And now he's surrounded by those people. He said, it's unlawful for me to be here, but I will allow the fact that I am here to communicate that something different has happened. But God has shown me I shall call no person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. See it in verse 29? I asked then, why did you send for me? See that? So many questions. I asked then, what am I doing here? <laughs> it's like possible to know these big truths about what God is doing and still be like, I don't, I don't actually know. I don't know. Help me. Help me understand. Because it's not all the time in these big speeches that unity takes place. It's oftentimes in conversations. Peter, we know for some of his great speeches, he gives a great speech, Pentecost, remember? Uh, but he also gives great conversation, great questions that he asks. And in this tight, compact, Gentile, Jewish-filled space, he asks the question, so why have you sent me? He's willing to ask the questions because it's not just in speeches, it's also in questions where we can unify our brothers and sisters. This is a conversation that changed the world, has massive, massive ramifications for how we view missions, for how we view unity, for how we view race, for how we use, view reconciliation. It has massive implications. For God has taught me that I shall look at no person as unclean or common. So why have you sent for me? In verse 30 through 33, Cornelius wraps it up. Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. What fertile soil, right? Peter shows up to the house, and I imagine him preaching to himself over and over again. What God has made clean, you shall not call common or unclean. What God has made clean, you shall not call uncommon and unclean. And he steps out of his comfort zone like few of us even know to this level what it would have felt like. He steps into a place of opposition potentially, and yet their hearts have already been prepared by God to receive. It wasn't just enough to take down the barriers of culture that had separated them. They needed to become family. And that only takes place by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, which is yet for the Gentiles to experience in the unique way that they will at the end of this chapter. And so he says, why did you send for me? And they say, this is my story. Cornelius shares his story. And Peter makes sense of the story and then launches next week, he launches into one of the great speeches that God shows no partiality. Like that's a powerful statement powerful statement, but what it challenges you and I to do is to ask the question, where have I drawn up barriers that are not godly? Where have I set up divisions in my heart and in my mind towards my brother and sister? Where have I set up divisions about what, who God will reach and who God won't reach? Who will respond rightly to the gospel and who won't? Because when Peter enters that room, he says, don't, don't, don't get me to the place where I'm calling these people unclean or common. They will respond rightly to the gospel, and they do, and the Holy Spirit falls. So for you and I, shouldn't the question be, uh, in a sense, why w that God would lower for us, for you and I, a sheet that challenges our cultural expectations, and at the very same time begin to prepare hearts all over the word to, world to receive the gospel. That's what TTI and other organizations like it do. They say, let my, let, my, let my own cultural bent, my own issues, my own limitations, let those go down that I might respond rightly, and at the very same time, would you prepare hearts to respond rightly to the gospel? that there is no place for us to discriminate those who can come and hear the gospel and respond rightly by grace through faith to what God has done in Christ. You and I are called into the exact same mission orchestrated by the exact same God to unify 
around the gospel and proclaim in that moment where we unify around the gospel that it holds exponentially more power than anything that could possibly divide us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we respond in worship and in prayer, would you help us to be convicted of areas in which we have limited you beyond your word? Would you allow us to be willing to be useful in ministry? Peter's an example of stepping outside of his comfort zone. Cornelius is an example of uh, people who you desperately desire to reach. And I pray, Lord, that they would, that, that we would be a people who respond rightly, who are willing to challenge any sort of uh, limitation that would keep us from ministering effectively in our area, in our neighborhoods, that we would have those uh, sheets lowered that challenge us uh, about what you're calling us to, to kind of do away with in light of what's been accomplished in Christ, and that we would willingly broach uh, the subject with others, that we would be bold proclaimers of the truth, not dispensers of it, uh, not, not dispensaries of it in any sort of way, but that we would just be proclaimers of what has been accomplished in Christ. Would you make us faithful to that task as we are unified under your orchestrating power? in a divided world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So every week we take a few minutes just to, the band plays and we reflect on what we've heard today and how we should apply that to our lives. And we also have a time of prayer. And we count it an honor to